The legend of Asena served as the creation myth of the Gökturks, meaning the Asena dynasty that ruled over both Gökturk Kaganets from 552 to 745. But as the legend implies, the Asena started out in small numbers, not as mighty rulers but fugitives and vassals of stronger powers like the Ruran. How did this family, that had once fled from the Tarim Basin to the Altai Mountains become so strong that it created such a vast empire and within such a short period of time. There are many reasons that we could factor in, but we need to realize that the Gurk Turks' rise to power was not a result of foreign invasions. It was the result of a revolution. And in every revolution, there is a man with a vision. In this case, the man's name was Boomin. Umin was not the first man to create a steppe empire. In fact, there had been many states prior to his rule that dominated Eurasia. Teoman and Maotun were the first ones to ever unite all nomadic tribes and as leaders of the Hanik Xiongnu posed such a threat to the Chinese that the latter were forced to build a huge wall on the border to the north. And the subsequent empires and federations further penetrated northern China, became synthesized and established their own empires like the Chuaba dynasty. But every record that the Huns, Xianbei or Ruran had ever established, Umin shattered them. In case of territorial size, military might and even diplomatic reputation. While other great Gökturk rulers like Mukan, Taspar or Tongyapgu are well known even in a non-Turkic world, the story of Bumin goes mostly unnoticed. It shouldn't be though, because without Bumin, there would have been no Gökturk empires and without the Gökturks, the massive spread and domination of Turkic languages and cultures in certain parts of Eurasia may have never happened. In the Orkhon inscriptions of the 730s, nearly 200 years later, Umin and his brother Istemi are listed as the great founders of the Gökturk state. But it is not, and never has been, explained in detail how Umin actually went from being a tribal leader of the Turkic Ashina clan to emperor of all steppe people. How did he manage to do this? With the help of ancient texts, archaeological evidence and recent research papers, we are now going to reconstruct the rise of the Gökturks and explain motives, reasons and consequences of Bumin's revolution. Our story humbly begins in the Altai mountain range, situated between modern-day Russia, Mongolia, China and Kazakhstan. It merges with the Sayan Mountains in the north and with the Gobi Desert in the south. This is where it all began. This is the place where the Ashina families of the Tauran Basin once fled to and found refuge at. Since at least 439 CE, the Ashina were populating the Alta region. A recent study conducted by an international consortium of researchers and scholars for the Max Planck Institute in Jena Germany came to the conclusion that the Turks, Japanese and Koreans all originally descended from Northeast Asia and slowly spread to the southern regions in a time period of several millennia. By late antiquity, the Alta region was not exclusively but mainly populated by Turkic peoples. The Ashina themselves are first noted at the Altai in 439 but DNA research suggests that they also originally descended from the northeast. As they were connected to the Xiongnu Hans by the Chinese, it is plausible, albeit not entirely proven, that the Ashina moved to the south, to the Tarim Basin, after the disintegration of the Hanuk Empire. Once the Western Wei dynasty, themselves of Tokro Hanuk origin, mind you, started invading the city-states in the basin, several Hanuk people retreated once again, this time back to the north. Among them were the so-called Ashina, Turkologist Senja Devicioolo had suggested that the main settlements of the Turkic people at that time were situated mainly between Lake Baikal in the north, Gansu in the south, Setyusu in the west, with the Altai Mountains being in the center. The Ashina family's self-designation was Turk, by the way, which is why they were also recorded as Türkiye in Chinese annals, which funnily enough sounds very similar to Türkiye the Turkish name of the Republic of Turkey today. But in any case, the Ashina found refuge from the invaders at the Altai Mountains. But this area was part of the realm of a large empire, the Ruran Paganet. It is probable, but once again not entirely proven, that the ruling dynasty of the Ruran were firstly of Mongol origin 
and that secondly, they can be identified with the Avars, who a century later appeared in Eastern Europe. The Ruran dominated the Eurasian steppe belt, or at least large parts of it. Their influence stretched from Lake Baikal in the east to the Setiusu in the west. While most groups who lived within Ruran territory were equestrian nomads or semi-nomads, the Kaganate was, as the name implies, an empire with the Kagan or Kagan, the emperor, at the top of state hierarchy. More so than the Hanik Empire or the Xian Bei Federation, the Ruran Kaganate was built upon a feudal system that empowered its ruling dynasty, the Yuji Lulu, by exploiting other low-tier clans or even federations within its realm, as well as sedentary populations along the Empire's borders. Thus, raids and incursions in the other states was not unusual and perhaps even necessary in order to keep the Ruran state intact. The Ashina clan was residing at the Altai, but was finally subjugated by the Ruran in the year 460 CE. There are conflicting reports though, like on certain not so reliable encyclopedias on the internet, where it is claimed that it was the Ruran who drove the Ashina out of the Terran Basin. Seeing as how all ancient Chinese sources actually point to the Chinese states as invading the Terran Basin, and the Turkic Ashina being semi-nomadic, while the Chinese were sedentary peoples, I'd rather dismiss the Ruran theory. Now, the place of the Ashina within Ruran hierarchy was similar to that of all other steppe peoples. They were vassals of the Ruran, and thus obliged to aid the Kagan in times of war. It is also very likely that all of the vassals were prohibited from exercising foreign policy as political autonomy was of course not a given. Thus, the Ruran period from 330 to 552 CE saw a number of rebellions by the subjects of the Kaganate, most notably by the pre-Uyghur and Tile people in the east and west respectively. The Ashina were, as we have seen, situated in the geographical center of Ruran territory, but not in the political power center, the capital Mumo Cheng, which was probably located near the border region to China. Little is known about their time under Ruran rule. All we can say is that the Ashina Turks were excellent blacksmiths specialized in creating weapons and armor. They were likely obliged to supply the Kagan during his wars with such weaponry and they also took part in the trade along the Silk Road in Central Asia. But the hierarchy of the steppe with the Ruran being at the top and all other clans at the bottom was about to change very soon. For the first century, not much is known about any events or important people within the Ashina territory. We have only a few names that I took from Chinese sources. And as you can see, these names are the synthesized forms of the original names. The first Ashina leaders of which we know the original true forms of their names are Bumin and Istimi. Being the sons of the elder Ashina Tuvu, they took control of the Ashina tribe after their father's passing with several dates circulating in relation to Bumin's ascension to the Ashina throne, we can only speculate that it happened in the 540s, seeing as how fast Bumin acted in order to achieve his goals, the union of all Turkic peoples. But did the Ashina by then possibly already have influence on the Silk Road? There is no evidence for this. All chronicles and excavations found so far indicate that the Ashina clan took the cities along the Silk Road by force. Provided a city recognized the suzerainty of the Turks, the Ashina refrained from fighting, added the area to their sphere of influence and moved on. But unlike in the western part of the Silk Road, in cities like Samarkand and Bukhara, the eastern part bordering China, Tibet and Mongolia had already come into contact with the Ashina. Thus, this facilitated their integration. But the conquest of cities, the incorporation of trade routes and the recognition of local subjects were nothing but dreams for Ashina Tuvo. He was a fifth generation descendant of the Shewolf Asina, or so the chronicles tell us. His father, Ashian, had surrendered to the Ruan Kaganate a few decades earlier. This period is known to mark the transition from antiquity to the Middle Ages. We refer to the years between 300 and 600 as late antiquity because in Europe, the feudal societies we know from textbooks had not been yet established at all in the year 500. In Asia, the situation was quite different. Practically all states, those of the sedentary and those of the nomadic societies, were feudalistic in structure. One family held sway, 
and was, depending on the culture, sometimes more and sometimes less dependent on the people and the lower nobility. A visitor from Europe could find strict slavery in China as well as watch the peasants of the Ruran doing their Kovi service. But a distinctive feature of late Asian antiquity was the constant migratory movements. While many indoor aryan groups stayed in the oasis towns of the Tarim, many Turkic-speaking tribes had already been moving west since the end of the Hunnic Empire. Many of them were organized in the loose federation of the Tile, or Tölös in Turkish. And when the leader of the Tile federation took up arms against the Ruran, the Ashina were not the only Turks who joined the rebellion. In the year 520, Anagui took the title of Kagan. With an iron fist, he ruled over all Turkic and other peoples. While the territory of the Kaganate had reached its height, the rebellions against Ruran rule grew in numbers. Then, in the years 545 or 546, the Turkic Tile started another rebellion. But this time, the Ashina did not join. Instead, their new leader, Umin, even attempted to disrupt the rebellion. He secretly reported the attempt to Anagoy, took his entourage and a seizable army, and marched to the west. The young Turk advanced into modern-day Kazakhstan with his Ashina warriors and crushed the Tila rebellion. It is said that shortly thereafter, he brought 250,000 Tila soldiers under his control. Now, this is highly unusual. Firstly, the official leech of both factions continued to be a certain Anagoy, and secondly, the question arises how Bumin managed to beat such a strong army when his own clan is said to have been rather small. This would imply that the Ashina were either a. incredibly brave warriors with superman-like powers, or b. were already a larger clan that encompassed more than just their own original family members with the others accepting Bumin as their Yapko, their leader. We'll go with b for the sake of our sanity. If the actual number of the Tila army was clearly smaller, let's say 100,000 instead of 250,000, then the victory of the Ashina could be explained rather quickly. Why and how a clan, which had been producing its own weapons and armory for a century and while still under the suzerainty of an emperor, independently entered into relations with another state, could then defeat such a loosely organized group as the Tila in battle is self-explanatory. Bumin's self-confidence must have been so high that he positioned himself in the political hierarchy between his Kagan and the Tile. Incidentally, entirely without the Kagan's blessing. It is said that by defeating the Tile, Bumin indeed became the new sovereign of sorts, not necessarily in the position of the Kagan yet, but still able to order the Tile to help politically and perhaps militarily. After the stunning victory, Bumin sent an envoy to the Kagan. His demands were rather clear. The hand of a daughter of Anagui. Umin wanted to marry a Ruran princess, a clever move because by doing so he would have entered the Yujiulu dynasty and as the rule of succession only included males, Umin could have theoretically become a successor of Anagui. From the Kagan's perspective, this was of course unacceptable. He had the Turk envoy return to the Altai and omit the following message to Umin. You are my blacksmith slave. How dare you utter these words? The term slave was not meant literally by Anagoy, but rather alludes to the fact that the Ashina were beneath the Ruran politically and had to obey the Kaga, in theory. This series of events is of utmost importance for the history of Asia for the next 200 years. But what is the reasoning behind both Bumin's and Anagoy's actions and words? To give proper answers, we need to take a look at the position of the Ashina within Wuran territory. As is known, no other Turkic peoples of the late antiquity were so talented in the production of armor as the Ashina were. It is possible that the Ashina, despite their close political ties to the Kargan on paper, continued to live in economic self-sufficiency, as, in fact, with all the nomads of the steppe before them. Since they were also talented archers and horsemen, who had to take care of themselves, their military capacities were not bad at all. But the numerical inferiority of the Ashina in relation to the Ruran kept Bumin at bay. Being a threat to Anagus rule, but not able to stage a revolt by his own, Bumin left the Altai once again and went south to China.
At that time, two families ruled over northern China. Families that were actually descendants of the ancient Huns. This so-called Twaba family, in Turkish Tapkac, had later divided into several dynasties. And for several decades, the Western Wei and Northern Qi had been hostile to each other, both of them being Senesais at this point. In 545, Bumin paid a visit to the Wei. In the meantime, he had increased the prestige of the Ashina within the Wuran Kaganate and dared without remorse to invade Chinese territory, capture available goods, and then retreat back to the steppes. To put an end to this, a certain Yu Wen Tai was sent on a diplomatic mission by the Wei Emperor. Tai was the Chancellor of the Wei, a kind of highest official who could also act as Commander-in-Chief or Prime Minister. He in turn dispatched Nanai Banda, a Sogdian from Bukhara, to the Altai. Nanai Banda's goal was to establish trade relations with the Ashina, both to end the incursions and to allow economic profit. Bumin, in fact, agreed. The decision by Bumin and Juventai seemed only logical and in the next step, the Ashina and the Wei dynasties would form a close bond politically. A year later, the Tila rebellion then broke out. Anagoi had now been in power for nearly three decades and was tired. His rule was tarnished anyway and the Kagan had not expected help from Bumin. After Bumin had warned Anogoi of the Tila's revolt and in advance put it down with his own hands, on paper he had actually protected his liege from an attempted coup. Therefore, he was rather entitled to receive something in return. But Bumin, as far as we know, did not want to receive any gold or goods as a gift, but asked the Kagan for the hand of his daughter. Bumin's self-confidence was obviously at its peak because obvious to any observer, including his new Chinese allies, the leader of the Ashina wanted to marry into the Wuran dynasty. Possibly in this way he could eventually claim the throne for himself. But to accept Bumin, a Turk, as the rightful heir, and then to have a half-Turkic grandchild was seemingly out of the question for Anagur. Even if he did not mean slave in a literal sense, Anagur's rejection was akin to an insult to Bumin. But if you really think about it, in reality, Bumin could not have been hurt or even upset. Because now, Bumin had achieved his true goal. The long-term plan of Bumin was as follows. He had first warned his Kagan of a revolt, then repost that revolt himself, and finally, because of his claims towards Anagoi, he had been rebuffed and insulted by his leech. The Yapko of the Ashina then had reason enough to have the Ruran envoys executed on the spot. He severed all relations with the Ruran. Accordingly, he must have ordered his relatives to leave the Ruran court in Mongolia and to stop all deliveries to the Ruran, because several years passed before the first confrontation. In the early 550s, he sent a diplomatic mission to the court of the Western Wei. He requested a marriage on his part with one of the princesses of the Tuaba dynasty. If he could not hold the hand of a daughter of Anagois, then perhaps the Wei Emperor would grant him his own daughter. Yu Wen Tai indeed granted the request upon order of his emperor. He then dispatched Princess Changli to the Altai Mountains. The alliance of the two families was now complete and with the Tile warriors in reserve, Wu Min began a rebellion of his own against Anagui. In the meantime, Bumin had probably united all the other Turkic tribes in the area under his banner, possibly also thanks to his prestige among the Turks, and mobilized them for a major attack. The Turkic Ashina army, led by Bumin, defeated the Wuran forces twice. First, in February of 552, in a rather small skirmish on the Altai-Mongolia border, and then in March, in a major battle north of Huaiwang, near China. The defeat was so devastating that Anagui committed suicide and his family fled to the south. The Ruran were forced to retreat from the steppe and found refuge with the Northern Qi, rivals of the Wei. Thus, the Qi also became rivals of the Ashina. Umin, now ascended to the vacant post of ruler, took the title of Ilik Kagan, Emperor of the Lands in Turkic, and founded his own empire, the Empire of the Turk. Princess Changli became Kagatun, or Hatun, a fellow empress, and the Ashina, the new ruling dynasty of the Asian steppe. Within six years, 
Umin had accomplished what the Ashina and other Turkic tribes could not manage to do in 600 years. For the first time in history, a state emerged that was both inhabited and led by Turks and became even larger than any steppe empire before. Because Bumin did not stop here, Istemi, his younger brother, now received the title of Yapko, Bumin's original title, during his time as leader of the Ashina. Either before or shortly after his death, the empire of the Turk was split into two. The eastern part was ruled by the Kagan, in this case Bumin, with the legendary forest Ötüken being at the center of power. Everything west of the Altai Mountains was ruled by the Yapgu, in this case Istemi, who was formerly beneath the Kagan but still in a good relationship. Kagan and Yapgu did not fight against each other, but I guess this goes without saying. I'm speaking of the Turk Empire, by the way, because the Ashina family, from that point on at least, never referred to themselves as Ashina but as Türük or Türük, from which Türk is derived. Türk probably referred only to their own tribe. But they were not the only Turks, meaning Turkic-speaking peoples. Most of the ethnic groups of the Tile Federation and the other tribes and kingdoms of Eurasia spoke the same language as the Ashina, common Turkic. They all had their respective dialects, of course, which stems from their migrations towards all parts of Eurasia throughout the centuries. On the map, you could find Turkic peoples at the Altai, in Siberia, but also in Ukraine. When Bumin's family extended their influence over the entire steppe, all of these Turkic-speaking groups also adopted the term Turk. It is possible that the term Turk had been common on the Caucasus and in Eastern Europe even a century prior to the ascent of Bumin, but that is pure speculation. In any case, their language and traditions had already been the same, more or less. But now, all Turks of the early Middle Ages were also finally united politically. With the ambition to unite all Turkic tribes of Asia under his banner, Bumin set to work with his brother Istemi. And together, they led the Ashina family to fame and power. Their first great goal, however, was not in Central Asia, China or Europe, but in Korea. Bumin wasted no time, because with the Ashina Turkic nobility as his backers in the large warrior case in Tau, he now controlled all of the former Ruran territory, from Lake Alaköl in Kazakhstan to the Gobi Desert and the Tarim Basin, alongside the border to the Great Wall of China. In the north, Bumin's influence did not extend very far, as the Kyrgyz, also Turkic, dominated the region of the Yenisei. In the south, he was confronted with two empires whose leaders were, as we have seen, of Hunnic or Turkic origin. He maintained a good relationship with the Western Wei after they had indirectly supported him in his war of independence. The Northern Qi, on the other hand, were hostile to the Turks. They had granted asylum to the remnants of the Ruran dynasty and settled them in the border area to the steppe. But even while the revolution against the Ruran had been underway, Bumin had already turned his attention to his first foreign policy goal. Because he wanted to take advantage of the general chaos in the region and obviously expand in as many directions as possible. He now penetrated into a region which had been left untouched by the previous Kargan of the Ruran. The Koreans populated the outermost settlements on the coast to the Pacific and had led an independent existence for centuries. The settlement area of the Koreans had been divided into several empires and as the southern part was ruled by states that competed in alternating coalitions, the north belonged to the dominion of the Goguryeo. This kingdom formed the pinnacle of Korean civilization at that time. For 500 years, they ruled over northern Korea, Manchuria and even parts of Mongolia. The Goguryeo had made contact with the Xiongnu Hans in the ancient times, but this was hindered by the Han Chinese out of fear of an Korean Hanuk alliance. Now, again contact was made with a steppe people, but the Turks did not come with peaceful intentions. Not this time. In September of the year 551, as the Royal Korean Chronology Samguk Sagi describes it, an army of Turkic warriors appeared at the border to Goguryeo. The army laid siege to the settlement of Sinsong. It then moved on and attacked a major city nearby. King Yang Won of Goguryeo then dispatched an army of 10,000 men. The Korean counter-attack was successful and the Turks retreated back to the steppe. So the first contact between Turks and Koreans had been rather hostile in nature. But this event later turned out to be a key moment for the Turkish-Korean relations. Enemies would later become friends. But for the moment, the Lao River represented the easternmost border of the Turk Empire. 
This act and his battles against Anagoy in Mongolia would be the last acts ever conducted by Bumin. Because shortly after creating the Turk Empire, which we call Gökturk, which means Celestial, Blue or Eastern Turk, Bumin died. We do not know how and why, but his death is reported for the year 552. Bumin's unexpected passing collided with several events along the Gökturk borders. For once, the Ruran remnants had not given up. They had gathered a new army and, with the help of the Northern Key, attacked the Turks from the south. In the north, the Kyrgyz were also anxious to repel the Gökturks from their border. And in the east, the Turks had just witnessed their first major loss against the Koreans. With the founder gone, the fate of the Khaganate was uncertain. Now, all responsibility for the Gökturk Empire rested upon the shoulders of two men. Kara, the next eldest son of Bumin, and Istemi, Yapko, of the West.